um, IMDB part one. So this is the structure um, I suggested for like all of the content uh, uh, I will be presenting here. So I will always motivate uh, um, my lectures by concrete application that's IMDB. Then we be, in the second part, we look at the data management and analysis issues behind that. I'll tell you about, uh, tell you about the basics to solve those problems uh, along the lines of slides and Jupyter and, and SQL uh, later on. Maybe today's not SQL. Today it's a little bit of Python and Jupyter. And then finally, we transfer the basics to the concrete application. So originally this was a two-week block, but this already is an exception. It's a three-week block uh, because it, it also touches web development uh, things um, you will see later on. So, but the motivation for this is website like IMDb. So IMDb is a, yeah, it's a website. You go to the website and then you can search for stuff. You can search for whatever, some movie, fifth element, whatever, yeah. And then there are some information snippets presented on that website. Uh, and then, yeah, another website opens up. And then, of course, there's a cookie banner. There's always a cookie banner. Uh, there's less advertisements here because I'm using uh, an ad blocker, of course, like everyone is using an ad blocker. I, I will not dare to, to switch that off. So basically, you get um, a trailer here. You get all kinds of informations. You get um, here, maybe I switch to English. It's still in German. English. Right. So here you have uh, the top cast and you have uh, the names of the actors and the roles they're playing. And if I, I click here, another page opens up and there's a more detailed list on cast and uh, who directed the movie. There are little uh, pictures of those people. Now, if you um, navigate to any of those actors, you see, aha, that's Bruce Willis. And then you get a list of um, stuff he, he's known for. And then you get the list of movies uh, Bruce Willis played in. Yeah, and then the question is, I mean, how, how does it work? Okay, I mean, it's a web page, it's returning HTML, maybe there's some JavaScript involved, but let, let's assume for the moment it's a simple HTML page. Where do all these information snippets come from? Where are they stored? How are they generated? What actually happens when you click on, on any link on this web page? That, that is what you will be learning in this lecture. You will understand after uh, having attended this lecture how that works, what, what is the technology behind that, what are the different layers, the different the, the stack as we will call it. I will explain that later in more detail. What happens uh, uh, when you click anywhere on that web page because uh, the web page is typically not organized that those are static web pages yeah? just with links and everything is HTML and stuff. That's not how this is done. Yeah, there's some system in the background that delivers the information snippets. There's some system that uh, delivers, par delivers parts of the HTML and then they somehow married. The HTML templates are somehow married to the data being delivered. And then you see this uh, nice web page. And the question is, how does that work? Um, so that's the internet movie database. Uh, it has data on film and television productions since 1990. So those are numbers from, from last year. That's like 14 million titles. Um, so it's a lot of stuff about every production. You will find stuff there. So it's very informative. I have a, a couple of screenshots here in the slides um, for you. But that's what I just showed. And uh, the question then is, OK, what, what are the data management analysis issues behind that? So one I just uh, touched, so how is data on films, actors, directors, etc., modeled and stored in IMDb? How are those links between these data items modeled and stored in IMDb? Yeah? How do you link certain actors to a certain movie or a certain director to a, to a certain movie, stuff like that? Yeah? How, how does it even work? And then eventually, how do we query the data? So, Assuming there's some sort of system storing that data, and yes, that system is not a file system, yeah? so there's a higher level system storing these information snippets. How do I retrieve certain data items from that system? How does it work? Is there a language involved? What is the technology behind that? Those are questions we will be tackling. Yeah, and two concepts we will be looking um, to at today are those two. 
entity relationship model and the relational model. Both are super old, both are from the 70s, but both are one of the most important concepts you will ever see in computer science because basically uh, entity relationship model is something that defines the, the very plan of the building you're about to build. If you build a house, you need an architect and the architect draws a plan in, in, in his laptop. And if you screw up in that plan, that will be hard to change. If you make a decision to, to set the wall here, right? That's the wall. And later on, oh, no, that, I don't want to have that wall there. I want to have it rather, yeah, that's a bit late. And that costs a lot of money. Yeah? Setting a wall to a different place, or you forgot to build a certain room, or the door's in the wrong place, or you, you forgot an entire story, or, or stuff like that. Yeah? So you have to have the plan to build your building. And in a computer system, this plan is expressed by a language called entity relationship model. So the more errors you do there, the more you will screw up your system and the more expensive it becomes. So you will see that it's super important to get the, that model right when building a system. Everything you don't get right there may hurt. So there are certain, certain um, situations where you can, let's go back to the analogy, so you see, you, uh, okay, you see, you build the house and oh, there, there's something missing. So sometimes you can simply add something. You can add a room, you can add a carport or something like that. Sometimes it works, it works, it, it doesn't hurt, but sometimes it's, it's hard to change certain things. So some decisions may still be possible, but some decisions may be impossible to change. Yeah? So um, you will always design the plan in a way that, that you can adapt things and change things, but, uh, and you can, you're still able to change things, but it's important to get this as good as possible in the first place. Yeah? And um, what we will do afterwards, just to give you the high-level picture, so we first do this thing, that's a graphical language, and then we translate it into something that's called the relational model. That's just a different way to to show this plan. So we have two types of plans. The first is really scribbling something on, on a piece of paper or, or in some software. There's a lot of software supporting these models. And then we translate that plan to a different plan. So we have one plan for the architect and for the owner who is uh, planning the house. And then we have a second plan that is meant to be for the, for the people building the house. Yeah, that's just, it's more, has more detail and is closer to what the people building the house actually need. Yeah? So that's a high-level picture. So this is about planning. And uh, for all of these um, slides, I have slides in between that give you a summary of the learning objectives. That's due to some feedback we received a couple of years back. You don't have to read that now, but later on, when you prepare for the exam, you can go through these slides and make check, oh, I got that, got that, got, oh, no, I have to read about that, that I don't get. Huh? So that's basically the concepts you will learn about um, in, in those slides. Just as a summary, you don't forget to, to uh, repeat that for the exam. Yeah, and this is um, basically what you see when you go to this website. So for IMDb, you can download um, subsets, snapshots. So this is one we found on this website, but you can also uh, download it directly from the IMDb site. We, we decided to download this one. And then you see a certain diagram, a plan, how the data items are connected. That's basically what you see on that website. So you see, okay, there, there are movies. Oops. There, there are movies, and then there's something like roles, so actors probably play, certain, play, play a certain role in, in a certain movie. And then there's something like, ah, director, he's somehow connected to a movie, however that works, you have no idea yet. Uh, somehow connected to the movie. So that's basically what you see. And in the following slides, I will reverse engineer the underlying model, the right model. So this is not the model I have in mind that I want to teach you in this lecture. So that's why right here, this is not the correct entity relationship diagram. You will learn about that step by step. This is what um, you find on the web page, and now we will replace it by the right entity relationship model. And you see how that works in the moment. Uh, in the moment. Hmm? So um, maybe some explanations, what you see here. Um, so this is a simplified um, model or description of the data you get in IMDb. IMDb is a bit more complex, but we, I think the simplified model is enough to explain uh, what we're looking at. 
and what we're interested in. So you see the notation indicates a relationship somehow. So this error notation uh, is, you see it here, for instance, a director genres is this one. Yeah, there is, uh, this points to directors. So there's some, those two boxes are somehow related. However related is defined, we'll see that in a moment. Yeah, but somehow this director genres relates to directors. So that's what the errors basically indicate. Yeah? Yeah, what else? So, just more details about the. Oh, yeah, that's basically the databases you get when you go to IMDb directly. There you can also download the stuff, but again, we have a slightly different version. Here's the semantics of the tables. Um, so, we will be using that. Directors should be clear, movies should be clear, actors should be here clear. Then there's roles. So, actor plays a certain role in a movie. Yeah? Movie genres, so a movie may be whatever, science fiction, drama, romantic. You may have multiple genres assigned to movies. Uh, then somehow you have to map that the director directs a certain movie that's represented through this concept here. And then again, you may assign genres to directors. So director may only work in science fiction or only work in drama, but also in multiple genres. That's, that's all fine and that's allowed. That's the semantics of those tables. Yeah, and now we start reverse engineering that. Um, so the first concept, we know, uh, there's actually two main concepts only. One is entity types, the other is uh, relationship types. And this is entity types and the intuition uh, of, it is, of this is, it describes a class of entities that semantically represent the same concept. So if you ever, I mean, you should have seen uh, object-oriented modeling. Um, so if you define a class in object-oriented models, that's the same thing. So that's a class of objects, a class uh, describing the general properties, like you have those attributes in any instance. And uh, every instance of that class then has certain uh, values for those attributes, but the class is a more general thing. That's a, the template to describe objects of that class. And it's the same here. So an entity type describes what kind of instances, what kind of, what kind of entities should be represented by that. Yeah? So this is describing, okay, this should in general represent directors, and this is, um, should, should, should in general uh, represent actors. Yeah? And for the moment, that's just an, a rectangle with a name in it, and the name should be plural. So it's not, not actors, uh, it's not actor, it's actors. Yeah? Multiple actors are represented by that entity type, aka class. So here's a, a summary of that. So um, an entity type EI describes and models a set of entities. Each entity type has a unique name, preferably preferably plural, so must be, make sure that the name is only used once in um, every diagram. And any entity type can be associated with any number of relationship types. We will see that in a moment, but never directly with other entity types. So you may never, never directly connect an entity type to another entity type. You cannot directly connect um, a director to whatever, a movie the director made. And again, this is here the, the stuff I already told you about, the similarity. So um, to do to object-oriented programming, so class and object in object-oriented modeling, that's the same thing here as entity type and entity. Now, we don't need object-oriented modeling here because object-oriented modeling, of course, um, um, also defines behavior like polymorphism, overloading of types and methods and stuff, constructs, uh, constructors, destructors, and all of these things. We don't need that here. This is just about a static data model um, that, that we are about to do. Yeah? So we don't need the, the full-blown power of object-oriented modeling here. We have a simpler model. And why is that a simpler model? Because that is good enough, enough for all we need to do. Yeah, in all of modeling, you should strive to use a modeling language and a type of model that is expressive enough to express what you, what you want to do, but not too complex to be in the way. Yeah? And entity relationship modeling strikes the right balance. It's super simple, but it can express so many things. Uh, and it's just enough, just the right, right um, degree of abstraction here. So. Um, we have entity types, now we add attributes. 
So we say, okay, director has a first name, has a last name, um, actors, same thing, first name, last name, gender. Hmm, directors don't have a gender, that's already weird in modeling. Movies have a name and a year they were produced, maybe a rank that could be used by IMDb to, to rank based on votings or quality of, of certain movies and so forth. Note that we only specify the attribute name here, but not the type. We don't say this is a string or string with a maximum of 50 characters or something like that. I just say that's the attribute name. One special attribute you always see is, or you often see is called the ID. Um, that's an artificial attribute, typically introduced to be able to um, separate certain entries. So you already see that when you, for instance, have an actor with the first name Peter and the last name uh, Müller, and you have two of them, how do you want to separate those in that set? Yeah? So then you want to have an artificial attribute, an ID, that, that, where those two Peter Müllers have uh, two different IDs. We will get to that in a moment. That's a very important concept. But for the moment, those are just the attribute names uh, and that, 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 that describe an aspect of an entity or relationship type. And the notation is an uh, ellipse. Uh, the color doesn't matter. The color is just convenience here. So I always use these colors, but you don't have to. Okay, so here's a more textual description of that. Um, so important here is an attribute belongs to exactly one entity type or relationship type, which means you may not reuse the attribute type if, if two um, entity, uh, the, the attribute, if it's two entities have the same attribute name. You like first name, yeah? first name and first name. You would be tempted, okay, you can also draw a line from first name to actors and one line to directors. No, that's not allowed. Yeah? That you mustn't do. So an, an, an attribute belongs to exactly one entity type or relationship type. So that's the rule in modeling. Um, and then you have, you have some naming conventions. So basically for any entity type, EI, its attributes are named AEI1, um, 2 AEI, KI. For relationship type B, that's the same thing. Yeah? So a director has the attributes first name and last name. Movies has the attribute year of release, yeah? as an example. So very simple so far. Then we need domains. A domain in a database language means a value range or a type. A domain is a set of atomic values. These values mustn't be structures, structured, uh, i.e. further uh, divisible. Uh, domains are uh, do noted as D. Yeah? Examples include an integer domain, a float domain, a string, whatever you want. Yeah? The domains are not specified in any relationship, but can be additionally annotated. Uh, you can do that, but you shouldn't because they are in the way. What entity relationship does is semantic modeling. And for semantic modeling, you don't need the types. They're just in the way. They clutter your model. Yeah? The, 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 you have more important decisions to make than, okay, this wall should be painted in red, or that should be painted in green. That's a different story. That's a second level concern. This is about, okay, there should be a wall or there should not be a wall. That is the level of modeling we're doing here. So, right. Entity type lecture, attribute duration. Um, I attribute values. Yeah? An attribute value is a concrete instance of an attribute's domain. So here's basically um, the relationship. So the entity type is lecture or lectures, to be precise, lectures and the attribute uh, of that entity type would be duration. And the concrete entity of a lecture is back big data engineering. Could also be programming one, programming two, whatever. But let's assume it's big data engineering. And then the value of duration is called the attribute value. 90 minutes in this case. I mean, actually it's 90 minutes for most of the lectures here, but some lectures may only be, or may 180 minutes, like four hours per week or three hours, whatever. So that's a concrete attribute value for this specific lecture entity, big data engineering. Yeah, then we look at relationship types. That's the second uh, important modeling concept here. So we had entity types, now it's relationship types. And those relationship types, they connect entity types. 
Yeah? So they express that two entity types are connected or related to each other. So for instance, you see here, directors make movies. Movies play in actors. Oh, oops, no, already that's a source of confusion. Actually, what's meant is actors play in movies. That may be confusing in those models. What is the reading direction? So in general, you should try to model in a way that you can read from left to right and bottom to top. That's not always possible. So sometimes you, you look at those names and say, well, that doesn't make any sense, right? But you should try to organize your models um, that you can read it from left to right. So movies um, and actors, actors play in movies. And you see, here is an attribute, an attribute of the relationship type saying that the actor in a specific movie had a certain role, yeah? a certain fake name, a certain role name that Bruce Willis uh, had in that movie. Yeah? And you, you see that actually here. Those are the roles um, you see here. So Bruce Willis played Corbin Dallas. That is the role we are currently modeling. G Gary Oldman played Zorg, and so forth and so forth. That's the role how we model it here in that relationship type. Right, so much about that. Yeah, here a bit more formally uh, expressed what is the relationship type. So this uh, capital type, relationship type B, is a subset of the cross product of the um, connected entity types E1 to EN. And that describes a set of relationships. Each relationship type in an ER diagram has a unique name. Again, yeah, that's very important to not get confused. Uh, later on. Also important is the relationship type can be associated with any number of entity types, n greater 2. You can actually, um, depending on how you read the n, you can actually connect uh, the same entity type multiple times with the same relationship type. We will get to that in the exercises later on. So we count each, each line as a separate n in a way. But you can also connect it to more than two entity types. That's possible. Yeah? Important is you may never connect the relationship type directly to other relationship types. So it's the same rule as for um, entity um, types. Yeah? There always has to be a relationship type uh, in between. We have special names for the relationship types. So with N2, N3, and N4, those types are called binary, ternary, or nary relationship types, respectively. And uh, as shown with the role attribute, the relationship type can have its own attributes, like role in that case. So basically, that's what we have so far. So that's the reverse engineered models. We have entity types uh, connected through relationship types. Now we have to talk about keys. So a key attribute uniquely identifies the entity types entities. So what that means is um, think about a box. I mean, you can really think about it. I didn't bring a box here. If you have a card box, yeah, a card box of whatever uh, a director. So maybe it's a bad example. But maybe uh, back in the days when movies were not streamed by Netflix and Amazon Prime, you had these DVDs. Yeah. So you could imagine you have a card box for your movies. The card box is that one, the yellow one. And I put my DVD movies into the box. Each DVD movie is an entity of type movies, okay? And now how do I differentiate those DVDs in my card box? I make them unique. I want to make sure that all of the attributes are um, that, that I specify, the combination of those attributes lead to the same DVD, yeah? If I use a certain combination of ID, name, year, and rank, whatever, it should always lead to the same DVD, but not two or three or four of them. It's okay if I don't find any of the DVDs. Yeah? If I specify a certain combination and I don't find it, that's okay. Yeah? But it must only be at most one DVD in the box. Yeah? And that's hard to do uh, with these natural attributes like name, year, and rank. Because, I mean, imagine, why not two directors produce a movie with the same name in the same year? That's, that, that could happen. I'm not sure whether there's a case for that. Why not? Could happen. Yeah? For, for persons, it's much more frequent to have the uh, same first name and last name. And so what we do is, we, uh, to avoid that problem, is we introduce an artificial attribute that's called the ID. 
And each DVD in that box has a different ID. Yeah, they are all pairwise different in that box. Yeah? If you insert the same, if you add a new DVD to the box, which has the same uh, name, year, and rank as an existing DVD, you just give it a different ID, and then you're good to go. And then you can add it. Yeah? So the basic idea is really that this is a set. So each box is a set of stuff. And the key attributes help you to uniquely identify an entity in that box. And the key attributes are marked by underlining. That's what you see here. So ID is underlined. That means if you specify an ID, they can, there, there can only be one entity with that ID. Maybe there's no entity, but at most one, not two. If you find two with the same ID, ID is not a key. So here's um, a more textual explanation again. So keys, that's a subset of attributes of an entity type also called the key attributes that uniquely identify each entity of the entity type by these attributes. The subset is marked by underlining. So very important is um, it doesn't only, here it's only one attribute, there, but there are cases where you underline multiple of those attributes. And it's important that you always underline at least one of the attributes for the entity type. You don't have to do that for the relationship types. Just in special cases, we will get there. But for the entity types, there should be at least one attribute being underlined. Can be multiple, but it should be at least one. And important is that the key should be minimal. And that is what is expressed here. So if we can reduce a subset of attributes and still conceptually identify all entities with it, then the current subset doesn't form a key. Yeah? So then we have to reduce the subset of the attributes. Example. Assume I underlined name. Oops. Assume I underlined name. Is that minimal, yes or no? So now I have it. The key consists of the attributes ID and name. If it uh, hadn't disappeared magically, so there's an AI understanding that name is wrong, of course, right? Um, so let's assume it's those two. That's not going to disappear. What's the problem with that? Uh, there? Yeah? Uh, it's not minimal since we can identify every movie using only the ID. So yes, perfect. Right, exactly. So, uh, specify or um, very good answer. So uh, the uh, duplets can already be identified by ID alone. Adding name doesn't add any value to that because ID already makes it unique. If you assign IDs in a way that they are pairwise different, of course. If you ha have an ID that's not an ID and give every tuple like the 42, then it doesn't work. But ID makes the assumption that's really identity, like ID, identity, hey. Yeah? So that doesn't add anything. So this key is not minimal. Yeah? And that, that, therefore, this, this is wrong. You know? Shouldn't do that. Yeah, and the second rule, um, if the subset of attributes cannot conceptually distinguish all entities, then the subset of attributes also forms no key. Yeah? That, that's the second rule. In that case, we have to enlarge the subset of attributes in an appropriate way. So for this example before, let's assume um, so here's the pen. So assume ID is not underlined, but first name is underlined. So that is my key. Again, I said it before, but what is the problem with that if I pick first name as a key? Yeah? Exactly. So I cannot represent multiple entities that have the same first name. It's impossible to represent that as this is a set. It must be unique. Yeah, so this is not going to work. Yeah? So every, every time there are persons involved in your, in your data, you have to use an ID. No way around that. Okay, so it's either about making the key smaller or making the key larger. And uh, one thing maybe we can also discuss at this point in time 
So I look at my database, or I look at the data I want to represent, and I look at the, the, the people, I look at the directors I represent, and I find out, hey, there are no dupl duplicates with respect to the last name. Now, there's, no sec there's only one Tarantino. There's only one Spielberg. Yeah, so now let's not talk about the Matrix movies. That's already brings us in trouble. Yeah, but <laughs> okay. So let's assume we use last name as a key, um, because the data I want to represent doesn't have duplicates with respect to the last name. Yeah, you you know your data you want to represent, and you see oh, there's everybody has a different last name, so there's no problem whatsoever. So why? So what do you think about that? Yeah. Uh, again, the first part, maybe. Tarantino has more movies than one. I, I, no, no, that goes in a different direction. So we're not talking about relationships to other movies. That's not a problem. So even though if Tarantino makes multiple movies, and most of them are really great, there will only be one entity in directors. You will see that later on. As you only have to represent Tarantino once, and he has tons of movies there and that other entity type movies. Yeah? That's a different story. Yeah? Yes, not extending the entity type, but assume the data I want to represent changes. So all of a sudden, I have a second Tarantino, maybe, maybe as a son or a daughter, or whatever, also now starting as a director, could be, or, or the uh, Bacholsky brothers, sisters, uh, the, the, the Matrix series of movies. Yeah? Already doesn't work. Yeah? So it would be a, it's a huge mistake to only look at the data you have in mind. You should model this from a higher level, from a conception level, and think about, okay, what may happen in principle? What may happen in the future? What kind of data may I see in, in future? And uh, am I able to represent that data with, with my model? Again, look at the house. Yeah? What kind of people are going to live in the house uh, 50 years from now? Yeah, like 100 years ago, they, they built ceilings like 1 uh, meters and 80, which is a problem for me, which is 1 meter and 90. I would never be able to, to live in an old house. Yeah? So they didn't foresee that people might, might get taller and stuff like that. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. that's something you should think about. Never design your model along the real data. Just take the real data as an inspiration, but um, foresee that the data may change. And um, yeah, you, might, you might, be, might have to enter other data items. So that's basically why you use an ID here. OK, so that's keys. Here's again the formal definition. Um, yeah, okay, just as an explanation, so how do I do this lecture? Um, so we always have more formal slides in between, but I'm not going to read through all of those slides in the lecture. It's more for you to repeat those slides back home and, ah, that's really the formal crisp definition of how we do that. Here I'm giving you more the, the analogies and the intuition, yeah? so you can read about that uh, back home, actually. Okay. Um, yeah, and then we get to this interplay of relationship types and entity types. So on an abstract level, it's something like that. So suppose we have a relationship type B with N participating entity types E1 to EN. B has a couple of attributes, and uh, each attribute may have a domain. That's fine. Um, but similarly, we can interpret the entity types as domains, so domains of type um, um, maybe see it here. So basically here, those are the entities of this entire... Um, so it's basically this represents uh, the relationship type. So here I'm treating the entity types as domains. Previously I treated um, attributes, attribute values had a domain like integer and string. Now I'm saying each entity type is a domain, right? It's the domain of entities. If you have a director yeah, the, the, the domain is directors, and the, the individual values of that domain are Tarantino, Spielberg, uh, Wachowski, whatever, what, you name it. Yeah? That's the stuff that's in the domain. So basically, any relationship type can be written like that. It's just an element of the cross product over the entity types associated, those ones, and the domains of the attributes of that um, relationship type. Yeah? That's uh, this one. Yeah? So that's the abstract definition of that. 
Okay, and here's an example um, with domains. So basically, here's the relationship type with n uh, equals four participating entity types. Uh, so here we have four, that's our relationship type. B has its own attribute, only one, like the role attribute we had before. And this instance of B contains five relationships. Again, not, this is an entity, yeah? So relationship in the sense of an object. So an object you can represent here in a tabular uh, way. That's what you see here. So you have five rows here. And you see you have five columns, uh, E1, E2, E3, E4, and then the attribute value. And what you put here in those columns is basically an entity of that entity type E1. So you put a Tarantino here that is movies and you put a whatever um, Inglorious Bastards here if, the, if that is a movie of Tarantino yeah, and so forth and so forth. So that's basically a way of seeing a relationship. So how does that work with this relationships and relationship types and real data? So again, we had this slide before and you saw here that I use an entity type as a domain. So um, basically I put the entire entity here in that table and if I refer to that entity again, I would replicate the entire entity in the, another uh, row or even in another table. So that would be completely stupid. So I just had a question here in the break that someone asked, hey, why, not, why not do it like people do it in object-oriented modeling? So if you have a class, the class can have an association to another object of another class. So basically a pointer. And, data, uh, and what we do in the relational model is very similar to that actually. And um, um, so basically when you look at the definition we had here, yeah, we interpret the entity types E1 and EN as domains we now do a shortcut and we say we don't use the domains, but we use the keys of those entity types only. That's enough because we know in every entity type, as long as we know the key, we can uniquely identify the entity behind that. So maybe if I first uh, show you the examples. That's the same example from before. However, now in that representation, I don't put the entire entity type here, the, uh, the, sorry, the entire entity here. I just put the key that I mean in entity type E1. So if Tarantino has a key four, yeah, then I put the four here. If Inglorious Bastards as a movie, and E2 being movie, I assume, has the key or the ID eight, I put the eight here. So I just have to put the IDs here. And with that, I make, make clear, oh, there's a connection. So there's some sort of connection between entity with ID 4 and entity E1 to entity with ID 8 in uh, E2. That's all I have to do. Yeah? So that's what I do on the model. And then there was a question here uh, from, from, from one of you. Okay, but that's very inefficient. If I put that in main memory, I always have to look up these numbers and back and forth, tra la la la. There are m many ways to make that efficient, uh, more efficient. Uh, for instance, uh, some databases bases, uh, replace those IDs then by, by real pointers, which makes it more efficient. Uh, maybe we get uh, to that towards the end of the lecture a little bit. Yeah? But for the moment, you just keep the keys here, and then you, uh, with that you represent, ah, there's the relationship. Yeah? That's what we do here. Um, and for the following discussion along the lines of keys, we need another, so we uh, I'm introducing a lot of terminology here, uh, but, but that's, that's important for, for, uh, for the lecture. And one is functionally determined. So what does that mean? Suppose we have a relationship type, um, again, B being a subset of um, uh, B connecting entity types E1 to EN. Uh, that's basically what I see here. And what you also see here is there's a one written at one of those edges. And we didn't have any labels for those edges before. I just showed to you those edges so far. Yeah, but now I introduce a new notation and that is saying, okay, I could write a one here. Yeah. Then this means that if I take any combination of entities from E1, E2, EI minus one, except EI and then, so basically I take entities from all entity types except, except E1. The entity in E1 is functionally determined. It is clear which entity is meant here. That is what this one determines. I think this is best explained by an example again. 
Um, do I have a more? Uh, what was the example? Maybe here are some examples. <clears throat> I think that, that's a good one. So that's how, how this uh, looks like. So we have directors. Just, just look at this part. I can do this focusing. Huh? Just look at this part. Oh, that's cool. Also make me pick this better. Bigger. So here's a one. Okay. And that means if you pick any entity from directors, Tarantino, you get zero or one villas, but not two. So the director determines the villa or the mansion or how you want to call it in English. Yeah? It's not that there can be two. This is, um, actually means that Tarantino must not have two villas, which is unrealistic. Maybe it's multiple. I don't know. Yeah? But, but here in the model it says it's at most one. That is what this one is saying. So in other words, you read from this entity type over the relationship type to the one, and that um, constrains the data you may represent. And the constraint is saying, okay, a director may live in at most one villa. Okay? And you can read it the other way around. You could also say, okay, a villa is lived in or inhabited by N saying no. That's no limit. It's a similar notation as a star. It's saying, um, yeah, no, there's no limit on the number of directors that may live in one villa. So two directors or multiple directors may share the same villa. That's okay. But the director must not have more than one villa. And the important thing to keep in mind is this does not imply, the one does not imply that the director has a villa. It just says the director has at most one villa. Yeah? And this notation we will be using in this lecture is called the Chen notation. Um, I think I have it written somewhere uh, above. So if you look this stuff up on the web, be careful. There are tons of different notations for these ones and ends and stars and minimum and max. That's another notation that's very popular. It's called the min-max notation. And of, and of course, they're read in a different way and they mean different things and they express different things. So don't confuse yourself with that. Stick to the Chen notation. Yeah, that's all you need for this lecture. We won't be using a second notation. Huh? So um, back to the formal definition. Here's Chen notation, right? Chen notation. Um, where was I? Here was I. So basically, that is what the one is saying. So if you uh, take entities from all other entity types, they determine, they functionally determine the entity here. Yeah? And you read it like this. Yeah? So E1 is determined functionally by the other entity types. Yeah, so the villa is determined by, um, by the director in that, in that example we had. Um, and here's an, again an example with a 4-array or n-array relationship, uh, uh, however you want to call that. So we have two examples here with some uh, sample data. So we have four participating entities, E1, oops, E1 to E4. And five relationships each, five relationships uh, meaning there's five tuples here in, in those tables, and the relationship type doesn't have an attribute of its own. So it's just making the connection between the four participating entity times, types. So let's assume that there's a one at E3 in the corresponding entity relationship uh, diagram. So E3 is functionally determined according to the energy relationship model. However, the data con contradicts that. Why does it do that? Because you see those two entries here, 1, 8 and 9, determine E3. Because if I write an e, uh, 1 here in E3 uh, in the diagram, this must be a single number. It can only be a single number. Um, but I have a second entry here with 1 and 8 and 9, and they point to 7. One points to 1, one points to 7. So that violates that property. That's the equivalent of Tarantino having two villas. That shouldn't happen. It must be the idea of one villa. Yeah. So that will violate that. Here in, in, a, in a other example here, let's assume there's um, a one at E2 in the ER. So E2 is functionally determined according to the ER. The so data doesn't contradict that. Yeah, because here you see, hey, those are different entries. So this and that determine the eight, and this and that determine the eight. 
Um, that's all fine. Yeah? So there's no conflict with respect to these ones here in that data. So again, that's what I just said. What, I, what we will be using is called the Chen notation. There are different functionality, there are different notations in the previous iteration of the lecture. We used the minmax notation. If you're interested in that, take a look at that video where I explain that in more detail, what the differences are. But to get started, just focus on the chain notation, just use that. Also, when you use um, software for the exercises where you um, create your entity relationship diagrams, make sure you use the right notation. Don't use the wrong notation. It can be super confusing. Huh? Okay, so I basically alluded to that. So functionally determined or not in an ER diagram uh, means an N or M or any other letter means the entities of this entity type are not functionally determined by the other entity types. It's similar to like a, an asterisk. Yeah? There's, there's nothing determined. However, if there's a one, it means the other entity types are functionally determined by the other entity types. And in ER, we call these annotations functionalities. Okay. So that's basically the functionalities for the IMDB example. Here there's no one, unfortunately, in that example data. So basically, there's no constraint whatsoever with respect um, to those functionalities. And therefore, that's switched to... Um, um, so maybe the error thing I could explain. Eh? So there's one thing missing we are going to drop, and that's another confusion you will see in, uh, uh, when you search for these topics uh, on the web. So we still have these arrowheads here. We don't need them. You, you see many notations that use these kind of arrows or other, other symbols. You don't need that here. We drop the arrows in the following. We just need, uh, use plain edges, and you just annotate those edges with those functionalities. Eh? So here it's N to M because there's a convention that within the relationship type you, you should use pairwise different um, characters here. So if it were ternary, you would say N to M to P or to O or something like that. O can be confusing with zero, can be confused with zero, of course, you shouldn't do that. No? So let's switch to an example where we have like the one here. Maybe let's look at the other example. Um, so basically I explained all of that. Yeah, that's the one to n example we had. So there's also one to one relationship examples. You see that here, directors own yachts. And again, you read it like directors own, and so does director determine yacht? That's the question. Does director determine yacht? And the question, and the answer to that is not this one, the answer to that is this one, unfortunately. You always read it across the relationship type. That's something you have to get used to. Uh, don't kill the messenger. I didn't invent that. That's how I found it when I learned about that as a student. Uh, so um, directors own yachts. So that means a director may own at most one yacht. Doesn't mean he or she owns a yacht. No, just says at most one yacht, but not two. That's not allowed. Yeah? And the other way around, you could say, the, the yacht is owned by directors, but how many? So the yacht is owned by at most one director. Yeah? So the directors, directors may not share the, the ownership of the yacht. That's not modeled here. It's up to you to decide whether you put ones and ends. Whether it may look arbitrary. I mean, you might be tempted to say, okay, <laughs> what the heck? I, I will be flexible. I, I want to have a flexible plan, like, like this house analogy Professor Dietrich mentioned. I want to be flexible. I make it as flexible as possible. I, I, I make uh, walls that can be moved around. I put every wall on, um, on wheels, yeah? And then whenever I'm unhappy with a wall, I just move it to, to another room in, in my house. That's okay. Yeah, but if you think about the engineering effort for, oh yeah, yeah, right. I mean, you have to put wheels uh, uh, under every uh, wall. What about the statics? I mean, some of these walls are supporting the ceiling above, right? I mean, you need a solution for that because if all the, uh, the, the walls have, yeah, you see where that leads to. So for the moment, you will see later on, this has implications. Whether you write a one or wh whether you write an any, we will see if you can write a one, this will be easier later on. However, it restricts you in 
the amount of information or the, the, the kind of relationships you, you can represent. Yeah? So it has implications. So you should try to restrict your model in meaningful ways, if that is possible. Be careful. Sometimes you shoot yourself in the foot with that. Then you write a one, and later on you understand, oh, no, damn, it's not a one. It's, it shouldn't be restricted. Yeah? But you should try to, to, to use it wherever possible. OK, another concept you might um, know from object-oriented modeling is generalization or inheritance. So we use it here, of course, to simplify uh, matters uh, be, because we have different types of persons. We have directors, we have actors. And previously, we saw, maybe when you go back here, you saw yeah, we modeled them separately. Uh, first name, first name, last name, last name. Already weird. Here's gender. There's no gender. Super weird. Uh, what about directors also acting as actors? So you en insert them multiple times. So you would, with Tarantino, he, he frequently appears in his own movies. Yeah, in uh, which was that? I think uh, Django Unchained. He appears, right? Django Unchained. He appears, and I think in most of his movies he appears at least a couple of seconds and says, "Hey," or is then shot at or whatever. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so what, how would you do that? I mean, do you insert the guy? here with first name, last name, and in the actor's box with first name and last name. And if the guy changes his name because he gets married, then he changes it in two places or what? Kind of stupid, right? So you don't want to do that. And therefore, you use a generalization hierarchy. Um, basically, uh, that's one way of doing that. You say, OK, there's persons. And uh, persons has all the attributes, first name, last name, and gender, or whatever else you want to model. And then we use this symbol here to say directors are persons. Actors are persons. And here you see, here we use the arrowheads again. No? Here we say, OK, that's the reading direction. That's the generalization hierarchy and, and, and the reading direction of the generalization hierarchy. Yeah? And that's a much, much better model uh, because you don't have to repeat all of these attributes uh, um, directors um, of directors and actors. So what that means is actors um, inherits all the attributes of persons. So actors has attributes ID, first name, last name, gender. Directors has attributes ID, first name, last name, gender, and so forth. Yeah? And of course, if you want, you can add more attributes to the subtypes. You could say whatever number of um, Academy Awards or what? Academy Awards, something like that. Yeah, you could add that if you wanted to do. Well, okay, actors might also have an Academy Award, yeah, so it's already a problem. Maybe you want to put it to persons, whatever. Yeah? But, but it's totally fine to add more attributes to the subtypes. Yeah? The important to understand is here at this point, so the subtypes inherit all these attributes, but you don't have to repeat them again in the N2 relationship model, yeah? which makes it less cluttered. Yeah, I think we can skip over that one. So here's a summary of uh, the modeling elements. Again, colors don't matter. That's all you ever need to model data. And that's a cool thing. It's just those few symbols and their meaning. Entity types are our card boxes collecting entities. Relationship types, it's kind of a different kind of card box. Uh, this is rhombus, uh, but still collecting relationships. And also, Again, be careful with your language. Like an object-oriented modeling, you talk about classes, you talk about objects. So I will do the same thing here. I will talk about entity types and entities. I will talk about relationship types and relationships. You will see often in, in descriptions that people say, oh, it's, that's my entity and that's my relationship, whereas those people mean entity type and relationship type. Yeah? Just if in doubt, make sure you to use the full terminology entity type versus entity. We have these functionalities in chain notation, 1n or m, or for ternary o, p, q, whatever, you name it. We have attributes, ellipses. Um, they have a name that should be unique within the associated entity type or relationship type. And the key attributes are just underlined. Should be at least one, typically, well, not typically, but sometimes it's multiple of them often use an artificial ID attribute. And then there is inheritance. You sometimes see that labeled as is a. Um, I tend to use R because if 
if the name of an entity type is in plural, actors, I'm not, I'm not going to say actors is a persons. Sounds weird. So when I say actors are persons, makes more sense in English, eh? also in German actually. Um, there, there you say sind, eh? statt ist. Okay, colors don't matter, who cares, but just makes it more readable. Yeah, then you can define that as a quintuple, blah, 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 who cares, right? You want to read about that, you do, I don't care. Um, were there <laughs> any questions? <laughs> Yeah. An ID entity. No, you shouldn't. You shouldn't. Uh, this modeling is about semantic modeling, and it, it, it represents something from a real world. It's not about sharing attributes. It's not saying, okay, because I have the same attribute, the extreme case being the ID, which is shared across all of the, yeah, that will make you crazy later on when, when, when translating that. You should always, it's very important, it's the same roots actually in any programming language in C++. Um, when I was a student, I, there was a famous book by Scott, Scott Myers, C++ guru. He explained those concepts again. And that's the first time I actually learned that and understood what the heck is going on here because I was unclear about that. And that's why we say R. You must be able to say directors are persons. Are you able to say directors are ID uh, entity type classes? Sounds weird. Yeah? I mean, it's, I understand what you have in mind. You want to share the ID idea here, but it, uh, it sounds a bit unnatural to me. I get that. I, yeah. What kind of my like question was, uh, is it to share those similar, similar entities? Yeah. Yeah, let's make it, I think I like the discussion, it's, it's cool, it's a cool question. So let's assume we have lectures that have a name and uh, we have um, study programs, I know it's a, uh, persons that have a name. Let's assume persons don't have a first name and the last name, they just have a name for whatever reason and they have lectures that have, have a name. Would you use inheritance for that to model name into a superclass? Yeah, if I ask a stupid question like that, probably the answer is no, right? I would, uh, um, yeah, the, 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 the trick is, and that's what, what I alluded to the Scott Myers book, is if you are able to say in natural language is a or a, and it makes sense to you, then you should use inheritance. So is, um, but what did I have? A lecture and a person. So is a lecture, uh, a named thing. Okay, now it gets philosophical, right? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, you could, you could argue that you're right, yeah? Is a lecture a named thing? Yeah, that's true. Is a person a named thing? Yeah, yeah, it's cool. But then you have other superclasses, like is, um, um, what else can we have? Is a lecture, um, a creditable thing. Yeah, you could do that. I mean, you could do that, sure. Actually, basically through interfaces and multiple inheritance, you can make it arbitrarily complex, yeah? But um, I don't know, I wouldn't do that. I mean, it depends a bit. I mean, that's the second aspect of modeling is, um, so the problem is there's no single right model. Yeah, the model is always with respect to what you want to express. Yes, so what do you have in mind in terms of the application? So when you create a model typically with a customer, you have what's called a requirement list or Pflichtenheft. You have a certain application in mind. 
And it might be, for instance, if you, whatever, if you look at this one, for persons, um, he, he have no birth date, for instance, here in the persons. And it might be okay for this application, but it might not be okay for another application. Yeah, or for instance, gender. Why do you represent gender in our master application system we're building? We don't have a gender. For what? It doesn't make any sense, right? Why would I store that even? So if you, you should think back at your requirements whether that makes any sense. Yeah? And then in this case, you could say, I mean, for ID, I would clearly say no. For a named entity, I mean, I would still say no. No, probably not. Yeah. But can we debate it? Yeah. Hmm? Yeah. I would um, I would have an abstract class called name stuff, but um, in the case the name is like the lecture and something else you want to name it maybe a, a, a particular task you have to solve or something. Maybe you have different restrictions for being the length or something, but that's not that's not a concern in the uh, yeah, I have a name for this. So Yeah, but if you use name, I mean, if you have a, an, a, an abstract class rep, uh, representing a named uh, supertype, something that has a name, it's very close to an attribute. It sounds very artificial to me because a class to me is, is more than that. That's semantically representing something on a philosophical dimension. You could argue, yeah, that's a named thing in a way. But it feels very unnatural. It, to me, it sounds like oh, you're sharing the attributes kind of. And then you could, I could make the argument, OK, for any attribute reappearing more than once, you could introduce such a superclass, right? I'm not sure about whether you gain anything by doing that. Yeah. That's, I, I wouldn't do that. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, but for every attribute you're using, you will have to, uh, to add the superclass. So you don't write the attribute uh, basically down in the class definition, but in the, um, in the header. That's a kind of philosophical Yeah, yeah, sure, yeah, yeah. Maybe we can take that offline afterwards. Interesting question, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the takeaway lesson is it's not necessarily um, a right and wrong in modeling. You should uh, try to strike the right balance, yeah? And modeling is always with respect to what you have in mind in terms of the application. Yeah, so in the exercises, you will see we will write things like, OK, we require you to represent this constraint or that constraint yeah, to be able to model this data and that data. And that is something that comes from the concrete application you're typically trying to model. OK, um, where was I anyway? Um, so now we come to the second language. So as promised, there was only one language, and um, this lecture consists of, of many, many different languages I will be introducing. And the second language is the relational model. And once we have our entity relationship model, we will translate that model to that second language, and that is the relational model. The notation I will be using is inspired by this book, which is um, very popular. I can recommend that if you want to read about uh, all of these things in more detail. It's also in our library. And the relational model is, is relatively easy. And this, it, it comes in two versions. This is a basic unnamed relational schema. It's basically saying a relation consists of two things. One is an unnamed relational schema, and the second is an in instance. It's a set of tuples. So the concrete types and numbers of domains are called uh, the unnamed relational schema. So the attributes do not have names. We just have domains, which is very unhandy and very, very inconvenient, you will say in a moment. And then you say, OK, I have a couple of domains. I combine them through cross products, as we did for the um, relationship types. And then I take any subset of that Cartesian product, uh, product over the n domains. And that's the instance. So that's very abstract, but that's how it was invented. And uh, it's so abstract that we're not going to use it. <laughs> Yeah, uh, so I directly jump to the named uh, relational schema and then I jump back to the other slides. So um, what, what we will be using is this, that's called a named relational schema. 
a relational schema defines the schema um, uh, only along its domains, but not along the attribute names, and that's super um, awkward. So what we will be using is something like this. A relational schema is notated as a sequence of attribute name domain pairs. So that's the attribute name and that is the domain. So here you see an example. So the relation movies has a schema defined as it has an attribute name ID of type int, attribute name name of type varchar. Varchar is just database link for a string and the year of type int and so forth and so forth. That is a named relational schema definition. These domains here, yeah, like in the previous uh, example, allow you to um, create certain data items. Yeah? You pick any integer here, like 42, with any combination of a string here and any integer here. So that's basically the Cartesian product over the domains. And this relation just contains a subset of those. And that's basically what you see here. Yeah? So here are the domains. Yeah, and this instance is just a subset equal of the Cartesian um, um, product of those domains. Yeah? That's a mathematical way of expressing that. Any element in uh, this subset is called a tuple. It's this uh, small t we use typically. The t tuple consists of the attribute values, of course, along the attributes being defined. And the individual values are called attribute values similar to the um, uh, as we did that in the entity type. Let's look at examples. Um, here's another one, actors. Uh, that's a, a named schema, a relational schema definition. Again, has this ID of in first name varchar, last name varchar, gender char, and so forth. And we uh, also see that some of the attributes domain pairs are underlined, like here. It's the same thing as in the entity type or we have seen before. That is a key. So this must be unique. Yeah? Whatever instance you're drawing from that Cartesian product, there may only be one tuple with any given ID. One tuple with an ID 42. There can't be more than one tuple. The same key concept here we're seeing in that um, relational model. Same thing. Yeah? And then the interesting question is, okay, now we have two languages. We have anti-relationship modeling and the relational model. So how do we translate from one to the other? Yeah, so we, you did your empty relationship model and now you translate it to the relational model. And the rule is uh, super easy for entity types. So basically what you do is it's a one-to-one -one translation. So maybe look at, let's look at the example again here, makes it easier. So if that is our entity type actors with those attributes, basically all these attributes basically now come attributes in the relational model in the named schema. Yeah, here's our key attribute, first name varchar. Basically, you're adding just the domains. Yeah? The name of the named schema definition is just the name of the entity type. It's really a one-to-one -one translation from this here to, uh, to this here. Yeah? It's really easy to do. So uh, that also entails that the key attributes you see here in the entity type are the same, huh? here it's just ID, you, use the, you will use the same key attributes in the relationship type, in the, uh, in the, in the relational uh, schema. Yeah? So it, it, it looks like the same thing, just represented differently. It's actually more or less the same thing. However, it's a different language. So it gets more complex when you look at translating relationships. So how do you translate a relationship? Here's again the long definition um, from, maybe let's look at the example again. So here's a simple relationship type, play in, actors, play in movies. Movies has attributes, actors has attributes. So what do you do um, to translate this, this relationship type? Yeah, you need to reference the entities in movies and you need to reference the entities in actors. How do you reference those entities? Well, it's just enough to mention the key. Yeah, I mentioned the key of the movie. I mentioned the key of the actor, and by that I form a relationship. In addition, I add the value of the role. That I can also do. And with that, you um, can do a modeling like that. You can do um, half. So movies have actors. That's the relationship type. I keep the, the ID from the movie. I keep the ID from the actor. 
and I keep the role, the name of the role. Again, like here, um, Corbin Dallas in that case. Or alternatively, I could model it like that. I could say movie ID is a, a um, part of the key, actors ID is part of the key, and role is part of the key. So why would I use the first modeling or why would I use the second modeling? So I've, uh, there are two modeling alternatives again. So we can discuss when would you prefer the, the first modeling, when would you prefer the second modeling, and what might be the reason for that. Oh, that's big font, right? Any ideas? So, I, I mean, I told you the key should be minimal, right? Now I'm saying, okay, you could also add the role to the key, why not? But, but why? I mean, the, the relationship is unique by picking the movie ID and the actor's ID, then it's clear. Bruce Willis played in uh, Fifth Element. Yeah? So if I take those two IDs, it's, it's clear, it's unique. So why would I make part role, or make a role part of the key, yeah? Actor could have more than one role. Yes, exactly, that's the answer. If an actor has more than one role, if, and if you take the first modeling, yeah, then you forbid that an actor in the same movie has multiple roles. It's impossible because the movie ID, actor ID combination must be unique. You can only insert it once. You can only insert the actor with one role, but not multiple ones. Yeah? So that would break immediately. So for instance, here in this movie, Dr. Strangelove, Peter Sellers has a couple of um, roles. Yeah? I don't know how many, four at least, I don't know, maybe it wasn't more. One or three roles, one, whatever. Many, many roles. So you wouldn't be able to do that. So you again have to think about it. You can't just mechanically translate that, but you have to think about what do I want to express? Could it be that relationship type represents something where um, I have to extend the key? Yeah? So the, the natural way of translating that is always saying, okay, whatever the keys from the um, participating entity types, yeah, those, are part, those form the key of my relationship type, but sometimes it's more complex, and sometimes um, um, you have to change uh, the key. Yeah? So that's something you have to keep in mind here. Formal stuff. Um, yeah. Okay, maybe that's something for the uh, assignment and also for, for making your life easier. So what we use is, um, you know, why do we introduce this? Oh, that's in the formal stuff. On key. I oh, know I have it here already in the box, and yeah, that's a short explanation. So this reference of a movie ID to um, so basically what, what you see here is where's my hmm, here. So what you see here is that's a reference to another entity type or in, in the relational model another relational schema. So movies ID references movies and it referenced the ID of movies. And this is called a foreign key. Yeah, so the, this movie underscore ID attribute is a foreign key to the key ID in relation movies. That's called a foreign key relationship. And you have two of those. The second is um, actors underscore ID. Here is a foreign key to actors and in actors, it's the ID attribute that I'm uh, referring to. That's called a foreign key. So we have two foreign keys here. Role is not a foreign key. Yeah, you could make it a ternary relationship type and then also have role underscore ID referencing an entity type, roles, whatever, if you want to do it like that. Yes, and then you would have three foreign keys. Here it's, here it's only two. No? And um, yeah, so... The notation for that, so we have a shorthand notation for that, you can um, either write it like this, yeah? so you, you have this, um, you don't write the domain here, but you just write the relation uh, name here and then this arrow notation to the ID and with that the domain is clear in a way, however, um, that's kind of redundant, so what you could also write is something like that. Yeah? So if you want to reference the key of relation movies, you just write the relation name. It's much shorter and much more readable than, again, repeating the ID. Because in the definition of movies, 
yeah, you define the key, which happens to be the ID. Yeah? So why do you want to repeat it here when referring to that specific key? It's, it's redundant, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah? So I highly recommend you use this notation. It's so much more readable. Hmm? Yeah. So, oh, running out of time here, oh my gosh. Um, I think we can still do this. Okay, so basically what I told you now, um, every relationship type in entity relationship, maybe when we go back to here to this slide where I showed that, so for every relationship type, yeah, for every green uh, rhombus box here, you create a new relation in the relational model. However, there are shortcuts, there are cases where you don't do that. And uh, to wrap up for today, I want to look at those two cases. Um, and that is if you constrained your model, like here, through chain notation, you said, okay, directors and villas, and there's a one written. If there's a one written on either side, you can do something much simpler. And let's first look at the uh, one to n relationship. So directors live in villas. What you could do here is, um, you model directors like this, yeah, and then you have a um, foreign key here to villas. So what I did here, I did not represent live in through a different relational schema, through a different relation. I just added an attribute. I added the foreign key to the directors definition. You see here, the, uh, the attributes here, oops, the attributes here don't have a villa ID, right? They don't have it. What I just did is I added that because I know this has at most one entry that is given by the one here. So this entry um, can be either um, undefined, not defined, or it has one entry to that specific villa. And as I know that the villa, there can only be one villa, this is a legal way of doing that. Yeah, so I, I, I save the work of adding another relation here for just to live in. And that works if I have a, a one in, in this binary relationship. Um, and the same holds for one-to-one -one relationships. There's a one on either side. There you can choose. So you can say, okay, if directors own yachts, you can either extend directors to add the yacht foreign key or you uh, extend yachts to have the director ID. Again, both attribute values may be undefined. If the director doesn't have a yacht, this is undefined, yeah, or here it would be undefined. You have to make a choice, but it's important to only pick one, not both, please, just one. That's okay, because one is enough to represent that information. If you use both models at the same time, you're duplicating uh, stuff, have redundancies, and that leads to errors, and you don't want to do that. So, so that's the shortcut. Yes, so, right, maybe I'll show you the notebook uh, next time. Uh, it's relatively simple, just to wrap up for today. So, how do we transfer that? Um, or, or what did we do with question one? So, how is the data on films, actors, directors, etc., modeled and stored on IMDb? So, modeling-wise, we have the entity relationship model and the relational, uh, relational model which represent that data. And now it's important, and that's a feature you will see many times in computer science. In computer science, we try to keep the abstraction layers apart. Uh, we try to have concepts, and then the concepts are mapped to another concept, 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 mapped to another concept, and then, hey, let's create machine code. Yeah, that's basically what programming two is about. Mm -hmm. And here's the same thing. So now we, we learned about two languages, a conceptual language, uh, a second conceptual language, and then down the road there, like w the, basically where the MPI sits, that is storage. It's a long way before we will be talking about storage. Yeah? So don't confuse the two things. Yeah? I, I've never at any point said anything about storage. There will be many, many mappings down the road till we get to storage. Yeah? So we don't worry about that at the moment. All of them, can, uh, storage can be handled efficiently in crazy ways. Yeah? The important thing for you to understand is, um, and that makes a link back to data structures and algorithms lecture. And the data structures and algorithm lectures, you learned about binary search trees, hash tables, 
how to store data on a file. No, it's not, uh, probably not. <laughs> it's not actually, maybe in some other lecture, you stored data on a file system, wrote it in a file, you stored it on a machine, on an SSD, on a hard disk, uh, on the network, whatever, whatever. Those are physical things I totally don't care about in this lecture. Yeah? Database collection, different story. Yeah? Then when you want to be efficient and stuff like that, that's a different thing. But the property, uh, what, I'm, what I'm using here is called physical data independence. All of the things we're doing here are independent from decisions like, oh, that's one machine or multiple machines. It's stored here or there. I use this data structure or the other. I use this data layout or the other. I store it in XML or in JSON or whatever, whatever. I don't care about that. That's a different modeling step down the road. And for you, uh, who want to become a computer scientist or whatever you're studying, um, this computer scientist uh, um, flavor, or whatever your study program is, that's important to understand. Because if you mess that up, if you too quickly rush into, oh, I use that hash table, I use that machine, no, you're doing it wrong. We're not there yet. Yeah? We're really not there yet. We're uh, arguing on a conceptual model. And that is the power of the relation in anti-relationship model and the relational model because no matter how insane the application is you're building assume you're building netflix or spotify or you're building a small web page for your soccer club in some remote village in uh, in saarland it's the same technology modeling wise there's no difference and the cool thing about that is um, no matter how you scale, so if all of a sudden your, your soccer club uh, in a remote village in Saarland becomes as big as Netflix for whatever reason, because maybe you kick ass like crazy uh, in soccer and you have to scale up, you don't change the data model. In no way you change it. It's just the mapping to scalability things and storage and machines and stuff like that. The physical dependent things that you will be changing. But you don't change any of the things you learned today. And that's a super cool thing about these techniques, uh, completely independent of these things. So. Yeah, with that, maybe a question two, a question three, briefly. So question two is, how are the links between these data items modeled and stored in IMDb, so links between actors and movies, through foreign key relationships in the relational model? How do we implement those relationships? Do we implement them through pointers, through associations, through 32-bit pointers, 64-bit pointers, through numbers? Physical data independence means I really don't care about that. Yeah? So much for today. See you next week. <clears throat>